owner doesn't care. They just want to open their doors. So how do they do that quicker? Well, I, I think that's where I'm saying this is the mindset. We all have to be in the right mindset. For me, at any point I get approached by a business that's running into a hurdle, the first thing I do is pick up the phone, get Minister Hunter on the phone, figure out what re regulation they figure they, they think is in the way, and we look at it immediately and try to get it out of there, if it is that much of a hurdle. The same needs to happen on the municipal level. We have to do everything we can to get out of the way of our job careers. And I'm hoping that the communication between the two, that if the municipalities are running into issues or they feel that our regulations are guidelines that they're supposed to be adhering to, that we can open up that dialogue and that conversation and that we need to clear the path for those business owners. Because the reality of the situation is business owners don't need to invest here. A lot of them can invest wherever they want. So we have to be able to clear that path as quickly and as fast as possible. And we're trying to address those issues um, as quickly as we can. Um, but it, it comes with healthy, healthy communication and a solid mindset that when a business owner approaches on the municipal level, if the municipality is running into issues with the province, that's why I am here. I'm here to clear the path. Our mandate of our government is to clear the path. So I'm hoping that with that, we can continue to build those relationships so that I can continue to do that. And as well, we're hoping that the municipalities are, are taking on the same initiatives and that they're, they're trying to look at how they do things with their bylaws, municipal bylaws, and changes that they can do to pull, you know, we always say it as government, we're great at stacking bylaws on top of bylaws and legislation on top of legislation. And, and nobody ever removes everything, anything. And that is the whole purpose of why we have an associate minister trying to pull all that out as much as possible. Mm -hmm. On the municipal level, um, we're hoping that that'll echo down to the municipalities where they start looking at their bylaws and assessing, does this make sense? Why do we still have this bylaw? What's the purpose of this bylaw? Is it hindering progress? If it is hindering progress, do we need to change it or do we need to get rid of it? And that's what I'm saying. This red tape reduction is, is a mindset and really has to be approaching the situation from when a business owner approaches the province or a business owner approaches the municipality, however it may be. We have to do everything we can to kick over, open every door possible and clear the path and not just keep kicking it back to them. <coughs> Sorry you didn't make it. Try again. Sorry, you didn't make it. Try again. Because that will just frustrate business owners to the point where they give up and they move on. That's very true. And I, like, uh, as both my hats, I really hope you solve that. Because mm -hmm. it's, let me tell you, right? It's an yeah. issue for, like, a lot of and I think that's one of the ones where I always say to everybody, if you are a business owner and you are running into issues and you're having problems, that that is why I'm here. And I will advocate and fight and do everything possible to make sure that you, um, that I clear the path as much as possible. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at, like I said, continuing to build those relationships with our municipal councillors, mayors, Reeves, uh, to be able to, to build on that so that we're all, for lack of a better term, we're all rowing in the same direction. Have you heard, are, are municipalities on board with that? I mean, it also downloads some work onto them. They've, they've got to fix their processes, they've got to retrain people, they've got to deal with their bylaws. I mean, there's some work involved. They can't just kind of rest on their laurels and deal with status quo. Um, they're gonna to have to move and react. And what, what, what have you been hearing in Highwood um, about that? What I've been hearing in Highwood is we need to do better. I think uh, we need to do better as a provincial government. I'm not going to offload this directly on the municipalities. We definitely have to do far better as a province. Uh, we're going to continue to do so. Uh, it is a huge part of our mandate and we're going to continue to to try to identify all those hurdles on a provincial level and clear the way. And you know, as when it comes to the municipalities, I hope that I can continue to assist them in any way possible to be able to, to help things improve on that level as well. One of the things that I, I heard on the street recently, and I, I might have this a little bit wrong in terms of 
um, how I'm going to frame this. So I hope you can come with me on this little mental journey here. But when we rate municipalities and we score them in the sense of how much money you're spending per capita on this, that, and the other thing, and then we put out this thing that says all the municipalities are ranked in, in this kind of manner, why isn't a spend in economic development and an investment in economic development on the radar? Why isn't that being measured? Why is like snow plowing and, and garbage removal being evaluated, but not the stimulus for economic development? That to me makes very little sense. If we're trying to save money and make money and make way for our job creators, why are municipalities not being encouraged via some kind of provincial being that mixed in with some kind of what is a arbitrary rating system anyway, and why is not in the mix? As far as just an initiative for the municipalities to be able to build on economic development, it's a great point. Um, like I said, we try not to over-govern our municipalities either as a province, right? I mean, municipalities are governance unto themselves. But if they were encouraged, if they had a carrot, wouldn't that make things better for your average business owner? Well, I guess I would comment on that, that uh, like I said, the municipalities are governance unto themselves. That, that's a huge mandate of this government, is to build on the economy in any way, shape, or form. We understand that it's required a healthy economy builds a healthy province. A healthy province builds strong education and strong health care, strong social systems. Um, and, you know, I, I, I don't know how we would measure that, but I, I would hope that every municipality's focus is on economic development. I mean, it's a, it's a critical part. You want to keep your taxes in line, you have to have a strong business center, um, business sector, sorry. And, and you want to make, maintain that as much as possible and, and continue to build on that. And, you know, a lot of the carrot that uh, we've given was, um, and um, I'll apologize if I got this wrong, but I do believe it was Bill 7, was the Municipal Tax Incentives Act. Um, that's a huge tool that we've been criticized on as being a race to the bottom, but this is done in other jurisdictions from Texas to BC to across Canada. And if you want to talk about a carrot, that is a carrot. That, that is something where we finally unchained the municipalities to say, listen, we're not going to force on you what you have to stipulate for a tax rate for a business. If you feel that business is necessary to your community, is going to increase employment, is going to increase traffic for whatever reason through your your uh, municipality. Utilize this to be able to, like I said, kick the door open, clear the path, draw that business in. So I guess when you're, what I would say is that to to me was a little bit of a carrot that you're talking about for the municipalities to be able to have another tool in their toolbox to be able to draw businesses to their communities. We're trying to free up the municipalities and hopefully they utilize those tools and, and manners in a, in a way that's going to help to build their economic development as they move forward for their towns or counties. So we got Justin. How's that going? You really want me to swear at this meeting? Um, that's it. Your floor, you can knock yourself out. It's your son. <laughs> um, not even sure where to. You know what? Uh, I will sit. Yeah. The night of the federal election was was a very disappointing night. Um, it actually was a point where I actually had to turn my phone off because I had media contact me, and I definitely was not in the mood to be commenting. I find it deeply frustrating. That's really uh, yeah, I think that would have got me in trouble. I I find it um, I find it deeply concerning that uh, for so many years that we we are still getting ignored on what we're doing here in Alberta. And like I said, I I could sit here and and blame Justin Trudeau up and down, but I have to look at it at the other end in the fact that this is not going to stop me. This is not going to stop Albertans. I don't think this is going to stop our province. We've always found ways around this. We've always been strong and we can build 
and I'm not going to let this slow me down on anything that we're doing with this government. I know our entire caucus is going to continue to work, and in a lot of ways it's made us work harder. And we're not going to let this, that block us in anything we're doing, and we're going to continue to make sure that we hold Ottawa accountable. And as you've noticed lately, we've been sending down ministers, we've been sending down the Premier, we've had a constant presence in Ottawa. And that's incredibly crucial. This is something Alberta hasn't been doing in the past. And, and not to, to kick previous governments, but I'm going to say we haven't as a province been doing as well as we should to communicate actually what we do here across Canada. I had conversations with candidates that came out of Nova Scotia, conservative candidates out of Quebec or the 905 area, and they got here and had conversations with us and, and they were blown away. They had no idea. I was having conversations with people, even family of mine in, in New Brunswick, dispelling myths. They had no clue. We are not advocating strongly enough for what we do here in Alberta. And we've been too apologetic and we have not stood up for how we do things. I have to be clear in saying we are the most environmental, ethical producer in the world. Here, here. This is something we can be incredibly proud of. And this is why we started the Canadian Energy Centre, because enough is enough. I will not stand up for foreign activists that come here and protest Alberta oil. Go to Venezuela. Go to Saudi Arabia. We are the leaders in the world. If you want to talk about who you should be supporting when it comes to supplying the increase in demand for oil and gas, when you want to talk about a global fix where we can get natural gas to the coast and have a far greater global impact than anything we can do by shutting down our entire oil sands, we need to be proud. Because that natural gas supplying to India, supplying to Japan, we have people starving for our energy, and it would have a far greater global impact than anything a carbon tax will do. And I'm, I'm going to be unapologetic when I say that we need to move down this road. The narrow focus of Ottawa right now, that Canada is the problem, is outstanding to me. I can't, it doesn't even make sense to me. I have less than 2% of global emissions. I think it it, ha, it it appears anyway in this little short window we've had that Jason Kenney has seemed to get Justin Trudeau's ear. He seems to be being listened to. He seems to be being influential. Um, Trans Mountain seems to be being built, um, and and things seem to be moving along. No, I mean. Uh, uh, they are. I mean, we've we've had some positives. I mean, en Enbridge 3 is filled online. We've had a lot of advancements on technology. What I always say about our oil and gas, and this is one thing we need to be incredibly proud about, is when we ran into a cur curtailment issue, a lot of our oil and gas industries actually invested in massive technology to push more oil through the same pipelines to increase their capacity and invest in that. So we're getting very close to a situation where curtailment is going to start to be trimmed back and we're seeing moves by the energy minister now to actually pull it on conventional drilling. TMX is going forward, but right now it is only going to the BC, only up to BC at this point in time. So we still have a hurdle there. Um, having Justin Trudeau's ear is one thing, but I will say I'm not happy until I see action. Because he can sit there and nod his head and agree all he wants in a minority government to try to hold his position right now, but until he starts to address the immediate needs, and especially things like the fiscal stabilization cap, and dealing with that, until he actually does something that matters and starts treating Alberta fairly, we're going to continue to put that pressure on. And what's your plan for the fiscal stabilization cap? Um, when, the, when I'm going to say when, optimistically, that changes, um, what does that change for Alberta? What does that change for you? In essence, what it means is uh, billions of dollars coming back to the province to be able to assist uh, us to be able to continue to build uh, our economy here and as well as 
maintain the province. I mean, the fact that they put a cap on the fiscal stabilization for Alberta doesn't make any sense to me. It's just not fair. Um, so the reality to me with lifting that cap is that's money that should have been coming this way anyways. And this is what I'm talking about. When we are doing the fair deal panel across Alberta, these are some of the things that we're going to continue to talk about. And we're going to continue to put that pressure on Justin Trudeau right now. And I think the reason we have his ear right now is he's trying to hold together a minority government. Um, so putting pressure on these issues right now is crucial, especially TMAX, and make sure, making sure that gets followed through. And things like this fiscal stabilization that every other province is supporting us on. Um, these We're going to continue to put that pressure on right now because he's he has to do something. We had to have sent a pretty clear message from Saskatchewan and Alberta that we're pretty tired with Ottawa. Because other than a little blip in Alberta, um, we're blue right across this entire province and Saskatchewan. So I think that sent a very clear message and he realizes he's going to have to do something um, to be able to mend those fences moving forward. Yeah, I feel like he has some work to do. <laughs> Mild understanding. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm cautiously optimistic that maybe, maybe that message has got through, and and maybe we'll see some, maybe we'll see some change. But it is maybe time to put some of our eggs in a different basket. Right? We have oil and gas. We know that. Good at it. We're great at it. We're the best at it. That's awesome. We also have some other things and we need to invest in them. Um, agriculture has long been an amazing um, economic driver of rural Alberta, but also <laughs> rural Canada. And I feel that gets forgotten about. And we have some trade issues at the moment that need to be addressed as well and that are as critical in terms of getting our product to market than our oil situation is um, and that's a partner relation so what role is the new provincial government playing in trying to fi fix that running around and trying to fix the damage Justin Trudeau did. Yes, that. That's exactly it. Is we're actually, and we get criticized about flying ministers around the world right now to repair that damage. We're trying to to repair those trade relationships. Um, you know, when we talk about the trade relationship with China, and when we talk about some of our other trade relationships, we've already had our Minister of Economic Development over there. We've had our Minister of Agriculture flying around and trying to repair these relationships to be able to free up uh, and get um, our egg moving again um, because it is it, it's crucial to Alberta and I don't think it gets forgotten about Bill 26 um, proves this government hasn't forgotten about rural Alberta and farmers and the repeal of Bill 6 and the replace that was another consultation we did where we took what farmers wanted what they were looking for and, and we enacted legislation based on that and that's that's how how much we're going to continue to support our ag industry, is uh, continue to consult with them on a day to day basis throughout. We have to continue to advocate for our, our agriculture sector too as well because I I also feel that um, the oil and gas has been attacked by by foreign activists. Uh, we're already starting to see the hints of that happening in Alberta, where we saw issues like Jumbo Valley and protesters there and i would like to say the same thing we have the most environmental um we talk about no-till impact what our agriculture sector is doing here we're leaders in alberta as well and we also need to start standing up for that as well we need to start communicating mm -hmm. our message around the world about how well we do things here uh, for our agriculture sector as well as our oil and gas sector um, so we're going to continue to stand up for them. We're going to continue to advocate internationally for our agriculture sector to be able to open up um, those those trade barriers that have, um, I would say, in some ways, are a direct relationship to how Ottawa has dealt with um, some of their trade missions. 
Um, so we, we've kind of taken it on our own shoulders as a province to be able to get out there into the international community and try to expand these trade relationships. Is it working? Like, are you, are you making, I mean, it's not fixed, but are you making headway? Are you flying these people around for, um, to what end? What's, what's been the movement that you've seen or the relationships that you've built? What tangible thing do you have to tell us about what has happened there? Well, we've started to make some headways into other areas like uh, Korea and, and Vietnam and, and as well in the Asia market. Um, our Minister of Economic Development was uh, up over there and opening some doors there. I, I've always said that the, the way to get China to wake up is uh, make them realize that they're not the only customer out there. Um, so we've been trying to push on that end, which has had some help and freed up on that end. Um, on our oil and gas sector or the investment sector or just foreign direct investment as a whole, that's a tough one. Uh, we have tried. Um, Premier Kenny actually flew to New York and sat down with the largest investment bank in the world representing $13 trillion. And this is a quote, quote unquote, directly from the Premier's mouth. He said that when I sat down with them, they said, we love everything you're doing in Alberta. As a government, we've... We would love, we love what you're doing as a government. We want to invest in Alberta again, but we refuse to do so with Justin Trudeau running the, running the government because he's unpredictable and we don't know what to do with things like 69 and 48 in place. I feel like they might be used to that. <laughs> I feel like unpredictable is the nature of North American politics right now, maybe. It's like there's a theme going on. Um, also, one of the emerging sectors in Highwood, and one of the things I think Alberta could do a better job on is really t saying how beautiful our landscape is and getting uh, more like foreign money in the door in terms of tourism. And I see the Alberta government investing in that. There's grant programs and other things that are being that are being heavily invested in. So what is the and uh, you know and part of the IEDC study that was done here identified tourism as an emerging industry that needs recognition and and support. So what is happening at the caucus table in terms of of investing in tourism? Well, I think we recognize trade and tourism is huge to Alberta. There's no denying we got some of the most beautiful landscapes across all of Canada. So when it comes down to it, we're just gonna continue to support the industry as much as we can. I mean, uh, from Jasper all the way down to Banff. Um, I'll, I'll say even Turner Valley, Black Diamond, all the way down throughout the entire province, we, are, we can create tourism destinations all throughout this entire province. So, um, you know, we're just going to continue to try to support it and advocate for it as, as best as possible. And, and we just have to be able to uh, communicate that. I, I think we're seeing um, still good tourism in Alberta because of the differential on the dollar. Uh, we're going to continue to see that coming up out of the U.S. Um, we need to continue to support that. And, um, you know, uh, as, a, as a caucus, we're just going to continue to try to find ways to to build on it every year. Going into 2020, what do you think the big issues, I mean, we've talked about TMX, we've talked about agriculture and trade. Those are big things to solve that you're semi responsible for provincially. Um, what do you think the big things are on your hit list that you need to get done? Well, the biggest thing right now that I think people are starting, I, I think we've alluded to already with uh, just some of the things that have been coming out in the past couple weeks, which is probably going to be one of the toughest things we do as the government is addressing the elephant in the room, which is our Alberta healthcare system. Um, our Alberta healthcare system represents the largest part of our budget. Uh, it's growing at a rate that is completely and utterly unsustainable. We're spending more than any other province. We have the worst service and delivery times of comparable jurisdictions. And the reality of it is, this is one of the toughest ones. I've always said, when you, when you go to address the healthcare system, it makes people very uneasy. 
It's the one thing that is gut check time when it comes to government. Um, we had discussions as a caucus where we sat down and literally with the premier at the front of the room saying this is going to be probably the most difficult thing we do. So we have a decision. We can be the government that does status quo, kicks the can down the road like governments for decades past, ignore the situation, it'll never get better, we'll never get delivery, good delivery times or good service, we'll always overpay, or we can, we can take, take it on. We can be the first government to say, no, we're, we're going to address this. And we are going to do everything it takes to address our healthcare system and restructure it in a manner that, for once, taxpayers are going to be getting, they're, they're going to be getting the most out of what they're paying for. Um, and I think this will be probably one of the most difficult things we do. I mean, healthcare makes any change that you make in healthcare is always going to make people uneasy. And I think what we're going to have to do is try to improve our communication. I'm going to have to do a lot more of this. I'm definitely going to have to make sure that, uh, you know, I communicate as strongly as possible to make sure everybody understands why we're making the decisions we're making. Because I think regardless, moving into next year, if we don't address health care, we won't balance the budget. That is the reality of it right now. I, I, I've hounded you in the past a few times about being bad at marketing and telling your story. So I, I, I hope you... I hear you saying you need to get better at that, so I'm I'm pleased you've taken my advice. Um, so, um, so is that possible? I'm gonna be really careful about how I frame this, but let's just say, um, is that possible in the framework of the unions? They're strong. They're they're almighty powerful um, situations there that seem to be almost impenetrable. Um, so how do you fix a funding model that is broken with that, um, I don't know, is it standing in the way, is that, or with that barrier in mind? <coughs> how, how do you fix that? Uh, which is at 8 o'clock at night, and yeah. now we'll launch into that. Yeah, we'll launch into that <laughs> at 8 o'clock at night. We're not. I, I, I do believe that. I do believe from a lot of the frontline workers that I've, I've talked to, doctors and nurses, and this is the funny part about it, when I was out door knocking, I sat there talking to doctors, nurses, teachers, paramedics, EMTs, all the way down the line, and I said, what do you think is the biggest problem with your own industry? And every single one of them, though they say multiple things at times, almost oh, well over 90% of them said, in every case, the redundancy in middle management and how bloated our healthcare system is loaded with all these managers. We have managers managing managers managing managers. And every time there's a problem, instead of addressing the problem, they bring together a committee, promote more managers to study the problem, and then pull us off the floor to just tell us how we're doing a terrible job. So they actually slow us down. This is going to be the toughest hurdle. Is, is the fact that we understand that we probably are looking at a, at a bit of a system that has a, a lot of redundancy and needs to be rescoped. And as well with that, I think we're going to run into a massive resistance. The unions are not going to be happy. Um, I will say that Ralph Klein did say if the unions aren't protesting, you're not doing things right. Um, anyways, sorry, that's my backup to if it ever gets there. But um, I, I do believe they're going to come out strong and they're not going to be happy about it. I know, first of all, they're not going to be happy about third party delivery when it comes to clinics and services. I don't think they're happy that they're going to be competing against private clinics. Um, but we've talked about this over and over. This is a new. We're just, as Alberta, we've been dragging our heels for so long and governments have been kicking the can down the road and not addressing the issue. That BC's doing it. Saskatchewan's doing it. Ontario's doing it. Quebec's doing it. We're just actually behind. And I think this change alone on, on expanding these private clinics to be able to deal with knees and hips and, and the surgeries, first of all, they're going to be able to do it at a fraction of the cost. We estimate that the surgery cost will go down. 
uh, on average anywhere from 24 to almost 30 percent per surgery which will allow us the capability to be able to do more surgeries in a year as well by expanding the system but i think the unions are going to be furious <laughs> why cheaper because it's outside the union system what like because can you explain I, why why it's cheaper because we have a system that is loaded with bloated bureaucracy and redundancy and i always would say that when it comes to private um, private industry, when you bring people in that are specializing in a, cl a clinic and all they do is knees, they structure themselves in a manner to be highly effective and highly efficient. And that is what they, they, they focus on. And in a lot of ways, I don't even think that it equates because they're, I don't actually feel it's because they're going to pay people less. I bet you they could actually accomplish and have that by paying nurses more. They're going to find the nurses that are highly effective, highly efficient, and they're going to bring them over, and they're going to try to run the most effective clinics possible. And I think that's why when we look across jurisdictional comparison on what we're spending on these surgeries, that we're recognizing in BC that they're doing it for far less than what we're doing it in hospital here. So are you going to, the average cons consumer of healthcare is going to think, I, I'm, it's going to cost me $10,000 to get a new knee or a new hip instead of, I can still get it for free for my taxpayer money. And is that going to be true? Are you going to take that out of the public system and privatize it? Or are you just going to run a two-tiered system, this one for the rich and this one for the average Joe? This is... How are you... Yeah. How are you going to sell that to I want to like be, us? I want to be clear when I state that this is publicly funded, universally accessible. This is not a privatized system. This is the money following the patient. Nobody is gonna be without this. We hear this rhetoric over and over again from the NDP pounding us from the left side. And I, I can't be any more clear than that. I won't say anything more than the money will follow the patient it will be publicly funded, universally accessible to everybody in the province. I, I wanted you to say those words and have an opportunity to say that before we, before everybody walked away and thought, okay, we're going to privatize healthcare that only certain people are going to be able to pay for. I think that's a really important distinction when we start talking about privatized clinics. Um, so healthcare is 2020. Um, any other giant ones on the horizon for you? Well, I think, unfortunately, we just got through a budgetary process, but moving into our first session, we get to do it all over again really quickly. So I think that'll be another hurdle is, is dealing with 2020-2021 uh, um, and taking a look at that because, you know, we, we have to make sure that we continue on the path. I, I think there's, a, there's still hard decisions to be made. And... I think that's where I sit there and I have, and, and I will say this, I think every change we're going to make, there's not one ministry that is going to be unaffected. Uh, we're talking about 2.5% austerity across all, all ministries. Uh, they're looking at those.